Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, if I have anything worth saying, please open their ears and their hearts to listen. In your name, amen. <laughs> Living in the UP for the last few months has changed certain aspects of my life. <laughs> for starters, we got a four-wheel vehicle, which is something we never needed before. I know with 100% certainty the difference between a pasty and a pasty. <laughs> and I find myself, <laughs> I haven't seen fall colors like this in it ever. It's amazing up here. Um, but most importantly, I find myself adding the word a e or hey to all my sentences. <laughs> and you know what? I like that, eh? <laughs> One other thing that's changed since I moved up here was the definition of the word road trip. There is no such thing as a quick trip downstate anymore. It's an event. Sometimes you have to add a whole day, a whole travel day. <laughs> now, of course, the worst thing about a road trip is a traffic jam. We all know what that's like. You see that train of brake lights going off in the distance and you mentally add four hours to your arrival time. <sighs> And it's, sometimes it's a crashed car, or there's an animal in the way, and even if nobody's hurt, and, and none of the lanes are blocked, traffic still comes to a standstill. Mm -hmm. Because everyone has to slow down and look out their window and see what it had, was. There's no reason for traffic to be that backed up, except that we can't tear our eyes away from it. I gotta see what happened. I kinda think that's maybe how Moses felt when he saw the burning bush. Scripture tells us, Moses thought, I will go over there and see this strange thing. <laughs> you just, you had to find out what that was. It's a bush that's on fire. It's covered in flames, and yet it's not burning up. How strange. <laughs> and so that's what we're, let's slow down and take a quick peek. And so that's what we're gonna do this morning. We're gonna slow things down. We're gonna take a look at this story and see if we can learn something in the process. Now, to start the story, we have to set the stage a little bit. Israel is in slavery in Egypt. But let's back up just a little bit to figure out why they are in slavery in Egypt. You may remember the story of a man named Jacob. We also used to call him Israel. And he had a whole bunch of sons. He had 12 sons. And they all had families, and that became eventually the 12 tribes of Israel. And he had this one son, Joseph. And he had a really nice coat that was multicolored. Maybe you remember Joseph in the Technicolor dream coat. Yeah, that was like my favorite thing when I was a little kid. Um, but his brothers, they hated him, so they sold him into slavery. That's like that thing you read about in the news when someone tries to sell him on eBay. They actually did, they sold him into slavery. So he ends up as a slave in Egypt, but then he gets free, and he becomes a very important official. Now that's a whole other story for another day, but it gets us up to the burning bush. At the end of the story, Jacob moves his whole family to be with Joseph, who is this really important Egyptian official. But then time goes on, and the years pass, and people forget about Joseph. And eventually, things begin to blur about who the Israelites were, and suddenly they're servants, and then they're slaves. And people forget completely that ever Joseph used to be important, and the Israelites become slaves, and people think that's how it's always been. The memory becomes blurred. So Israel becomes slaves, and they've been living in slavery so long, they have forgotten who else they could be. Time has blurred their sense of identity. They have forgotten what it means to be free. And so God has decided to free the Israelites, but it's not enough just to free them. He has to change their whole sense of identity. He's got to wow them a little bit. He has to show them without any, without fail, without any doubt, who he is and what he's capable of. It's going to be kind of a spectacle. <laughs> to shift their identity from slaves to his people, something epic needs to happen. So we start our story with the burning bush. Now that's already pretty cool. It's impossible. It's amazing. And that's just the introduction. So then God sends Moses to Pharaoh. Are you sure? Yes. But it's too easy for Pharaoh to just let them go. 
It's too easy for him to say, so God hardens Pharaoh's heart. It's not a big enough statement if Pharaoh had just said, no, go ahead, you can leave. That's not enough. The point of the story isn't actually just freeing Israel. It's how he frees Israel. God should. He hardens Pharaoh's heart and he refuses, and then come the ten plagues. We're familiar with this story. God shows the breadth of his power by raining plagues down on Egypt. It's kind of unfortunate, but it's kind of awesome to watch. I'm sure it was quite the show. He turns rivers to blood. He sends all sorts of animals, frogs, gnats, flies, locusts. The livestock start to die. The people start to get boils all over. And then he sends the plague of darkness. I think this is probably my favorite one. It's very cool. He just turns the sun off for three days. He rains hail and lightning down upon Egypt. It's said to be the worst storm Egypt has ever seen since it was founded. It's amazing. And with every plague, God is further showing his power. God is further demonstrating who he is. One inescapable fact becomes so obvious. God is in control. And then we come to the last plague. If you know the story well, you know what I'm about to say. The plague of death. In a single night, all firstborn children of all the Egyptians die. They're all taken. A lot of the plagues are annoying. You know, flies, gnats, boils. This one is devastating. God, God takes all the children. God is in control. He's in control of the land, the animals, the sky, the sun, even life itself. But this leaves us with kind of a weird situation. Who is a God who would do this? Who is this God? God killed those children. I get goosebump pimples just saying that. That's awful. What is that? Some people like to sweep this story under the rug. It's embarrassing. We don't know how to understand it, so we just don't. But God doesn't hide who he is, so I'm not going to hide it either. There are pieces of the Bible that are not easy to understand. There are stories that don't make any sense to us who don't see the whole picture. When you only look at the picture from this side of the equation, it looks really bad. Let me ask you this. Do you think God took care of those children? Right? From our side of the equation, it looks like God just killed those children. That's awful, but we don't see the whole picture. Now, I can't make any claims as to what actually happened. It doesn't tell us. The Bible is moot on this point. But, personally, I believe he took care of those children. He brought them to something even better than this life. We don't see the whole picture. The, the God we know is a God of love, and we can trust in that God, even in moments when we don't understand. This happens a lot in our lives, too. How many of you have ever had something horrible happen in your life? Better yet, how many of you know someone, doesn't even have to be you, who has had something horrible happen in their life that doesn't make sense if there is a God of love out there? Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah. What is that? The Bible... There are moments in life when we want to scream in frustration at God. I said this at a funeral recently. The Bible is full of people screaming at God. It's okay to be honest about what we feel. 1 Corinthians 13 tells us that this life that we see, we look at it like a dusty mirror. We can't see very clearly. We don't see the whole picture. We don't see the whole design. But we can trust in the one who does see the whole design. We can trust in an awesome, all-powerful God who does see the whole picture. When we don't know the answers, we can trust in the one who does. Let me say that again. When we don't know the answers, there are some passages of Scripture. When I read them and I can explain them to you guys and I can give you the answers, but there are some passages where I don't have an answer. I don't know. And I'm just going to be upfront about that with you guys. There are times when I won't know the answer. But we can trust in the God who does know the answer. And so the story continues and we get to the end. Pharaoh lets the slaves go. But then he changes his mind and sends the warriors after them. So the Israelites, they get to the Red Sea. They got their back up against the Red Sea. Pharaoh's armies are pressing in. It's terrifying. 
And then God steps in again. Chapter 14, God sends a pillar of fire and smoke and cuts off Pharaoh's army. I think that would have been probably the coolest part. If you've seen the movies, you know what I'm talking about. A big pillar of fire comes down and cuts off Pharaoh's armies. And you all know what happens next. You've seen the Charlton Heston movie. He puts his hand out over the water. And God sends the wind and he literally parts the ocean, the, the sea. Our God is an awesome God. That's epic. Our God is awesome. Pharaoh's army goes in after them, but then God jams their wheels. And the, the Egyptians in verse, I think it's 25, let me check. Yeah, verse 25, the Egyptians say, let's get away from the Israelites. God is clearly fighting for them. Why are we chasing them? Let them go. Even by the, by the end of this story, even the Egyptians have to admit what's happening here. Our God is a God of power and might. God said he would free Israel. And the story is designed to show us two main things. God is powerful and God is trustworthy. God said, I will free Israel. But it didn't happen right away. In fact, Immediately after Moses tells Pharaoh why he's there, the first time he shows up, Pharaoh increases the workload on the slaves. Their lives get worse for a little while. The night is darkest right before the dawn. And I'm sure Israel would have appreciated just a quick and easy solution. They didn't need this whole plague business. They would have just been happy to be free. But we have to remember that this is God's schedule, not our schedule. We, we, we can trust in God. God is so powerful. He is so worthy of our trust. But with that trust comes patience. We have to let God do things on God's time. He knows what he's doing. If we get impatient with God, we come up with the conclusion that God is not trustworthy because he didn't answer it the way I wanted it, in my timeline. And suddenly we stop trusting God. This happens in every life. We are not in control. We can't see the whole picture yet. It's God's schedule. When we don't know the answer, we can trust in the one who does. So the first thing the story shows us is that God is trustworthy. And the second thing is that it shows that God is powerful. God is awesome. We've got plagues, he's sending on fire, burning bush, lightning and hail from the sky, parting the ocean. Our God is an awesome God. This, God is the very definition of epic in the dictionary next to the word epic. It should just be a picture of God. Except God is so awesome, we don't know how to draw him, so that really wouldn't work out. In the beginning of the story, God calls out to Moses from the burning bush. He says, take your shoes off. You're standing on holy ground. Now, there's a really popular misconception about that. There is nothing special about the dirt. There's nothing special about the ground. It is holy because God is there. God is awesome. God is holy, not, not dirt. It's not a special place. It's special because God is there. Yeah, our God is powerful. There's, there's a theory out there. It's kind of interesting. There are some folks who try to explain this story logically. And so they read this story of the Red Sea. And they're like, well, actually, that's a mistranslation. What it really says is that the Israelites crossed over the Reed Sea. You see, there are some swampy areas outside of Egypt. And so there's some scholars who believe that what actually happened was that God showed Israel a path across the dry land through a swamp. And that's how Israel got away. It's an interesting theory. Some people get real upset when they hear that. They're like, no, I want the epic story. <laughs> Reed Sea. <laughs> Personally, I think it's kind of clever. Reed Sea, Red Sea. You can see how they could get there. It's close. <laughs> but it's not what the book says. It's not how it presented, how it's presented in the Bible. Now, I am not saying that the Bible is 100% historically accurate. I don't think it was written as a history book. I think it was written to show us something. Personally, I think God parted the Red Sea. That's what I think. I think that's what happened. But I'm human. I don't know. I wasn't there. Right? If I got to heaven and God said, no, really, I just let him through a swamp, I'd be like, oh, okay, great. <laughs> it's God. He can do whatever he wants. 
But I believe this story is told to us in this way to show us something. This design is to show us that God is epic. God is awesome. We're supposed to draw that from this story. That's why it's written this way. God is awesome. God is trustworthy. This is a story of trust and awe. Now, God heard their cries. God freed his people, but he did it in a way that left a mark. Everything in the story is intentional. Everything in the story is the way it is on purpose. This was God's action. It was God freeing his people. But at the end of the day, it was Moses who stood in front of Pharaoh. Not even just Moses, Moses and Aaron standing in front of Pharaoh. God chose to act in the world, but he also chose to use humans. God empowers us to be the change that we want to see in the world. God is God. Is God. He is awesome and powerful, and this is a story that shows that. If he wanted, he could have freed Israel all by himself. But he chose to use humans, Moses, Aaron, Pharaoh. God chooses to work through humanity in order to save the world. We can trust God. Can God trust you? God works through us. Will we step up to the challenge? We can trust God. Can God trust you to do the job? I say everything in the story was intentional. God was epic in this story. This is a story of big, splashy things, you know? Rivers turning to blood, things raining down from the sky, animals going crazy. It's a very cool story. And every time I read it, I come up with the same question. Where is that stuff nowadays? Man, wouldn't that be cool? <laughs> Personally, I think it would be very helpful if my bushes lit on fire every now and then to tell me what to do in life, get some career advice from my shrubs, that would be very handy. <laughs> How handy would it be if we had a God who would step out of the skies to stop our enemies? It would be so helpful. I have a theory about why God doesn't act this way, but we have to, you have to stick with me, it's a little tricky. There is a parallel in history. In the beginning of our story, Israel is in slavery. They're lost. They don't know who they are. God comes. God acts. And he frees them. And it's awesome. And so then the Jewish people start a tradition called Passover. They have this celebration. It's an annual party. Every year they get together and they celebrate what God did in Egypt. Thousands of years later, a man named Jesus, on Passover night, sat down and gave us the tradition of communion. Communion is us remembering what God does for us. And what Jesus did for us was on the night which they were remembering what God did in Egypt. There is a parallel there. Israel was in slavery. We start off in slavery. God acted. Jesus acted and freed us. And it was awesome. You see the cycle, the parallels. I get lost in that, I just think it's the coolest thing ever. <laughs> Communion is all about remembering what God did for us, what Jesus did for us. And one of the things Jesus did for us was sent his Holy Spirit to us. There is a piece of Jesus living within each of us. Call it the Holy Spirit, call it a conscience, call it whatever you want. There's a piece of God dwelling within us. This story is about how we can trust God, but it points to how God can trust us. We have a big job. We're being sent out into the world, but we're not going out there alone. God doesn't send us alone. Moses was not alone when he went before Pharaoh. We are not alone when we face the world. God is there for us. We pray every single Sunday at the beginning of our service, we do something called the prayer of invocation. What we ask for is we say, God, please come into this presence. Come here and dwell with us. Fill us with your spirit. That's our prayer every single Sunday. And it's a corporate thing because we all do it together. But that could be a personal prayer. Some of you folks maybe don't pray every day. Maybe you do add this to it. If you don't pray, this is my challenge to you this week. It's a really easy one. Take five seconds. It doesn't even take five minutes. Take five seconds when you wake up in the morning or right before you go to bed and just pray this prayer. God, help me to do
do great things in the world. Inspire me to do great things in your world. God doesn't do the big, splashy things anymore because he's handed the job over to you. He's given us that responsibility. We can do this. With his help, we can do this. Trust God. Be awed by God, and God will trust you. And when God trusts you, there is no limit to the things we can do for his kingdom. Amen.